thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you all. And I hope this finds you all well. So the subject tonight is self-transcendence. And let's start with the word self, a word that you hear every day, that you use every day, and you think you know what it means. But if you look into it, you realize you may not know as much about what it means as you may think. This is, in fact, true of all of the most commonly used words. You can prove this by going to your dictionary and looking up left, right, up, down. How do you define those? Uh, well, what's up, not down? Uh, what, what's down, not up? Um, it um, becomes very, very circular. And perhaps that's true to some degree of the self, which has many meanings and many dimensions. The second word in tonight's talk is transcendence. And transcendence means, of course, going past. Going past the self. Whose self? Yours. You're going past yourself. But wait a minute. If you've gone past yourself, aren't you here now? Is, didn't yourself come along with you? And this at least gives an idea of why so much of the mystical, esoteric, spiritual writings of the world start to sound very paradoxical. Well, you're neither here nor there, or you're both here, you're both there. Um, as the um, Hindus like to say, neti neti, not this, not that. All of which give us some idea of uh, the dimensions of this question. But let me start by quoting the beginning of the Iliad of Homer. Achilles' wrath to Greece, the direful spring of woes unnumbered, heavenly goddess, sing. The wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign the souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry vultures tore, and so on. Uh, that is a translation of Alexander Pope. And because he's one of the greatest poets in the English language, uh, he took some poetic license with us. And the word I'd like to draw your attention to is limbs. They're limbs unburied on the naked shore. Well, limbs doesn't really mean limbs or that's not the word in the Greek. The word in the Greek is autus. And autus or autos means self. As you all know from words like automatic and so on. So wait a minute. When these chiefs were killed, their souls, which is the word pretty much is psyche, which is pretty much our word psyche, uh, went to Hades. Uh, and um, they themselves were lying on the shore. So it sounds as if in those times, and the Homeric poems came into shape between, say, 700 and 500 BC, although uh, some of the material goes back much further than that, people basically thought of themselves, themselves as the body. The, the soul was, you know, the soul was actually a rather shadowy thing, and it went down into uh, a miserable evanescence in Hades, uh, which is a dark, gloomy place where they didn't exactly torture you, but it wasn't exactly much fun either. In another Homeric poem, the Odyssey, Achilles, the ghost of Achilles tells Odysseus, I had rather be a poor man's serf than king of all the dead. So in those days, it would seem, people identified themselves with their bodies. And primarily, we still do this. The self is the body. What is self-preservation? The preservation of the body. In fact, if you set aside the body, as certain mystical teachings tell you you might do, at least conceptually, 
What's there to preserve? It's only a body that can get hurt. It's only a body that can starve. It's only a body that can sick and die. Uh, so what is it beyond that? Do many people go past this level? Well, that's a good question. Certainly on a day-to-day -day basis, we often act as if, as I just said, our bodies are ourselves. At the very lowest human common denominator, there are people who are unable to think of themselves other than in terms of their bodily urges. I want this, I want that, give me, me angry, me fight. That is not necessarily primitive society, but it is probably the, the most primitive level of human development, which um, unfortunately uh, exists all too commonly in a remarkably advanced society like our own, as you know. So that is one level. You are not, you are your bodily drives. You want that, you get that. Uh, you actually have no, you know, at the very, the crudest levels of, of sociopathy, you have no idea that other people are um, anything more than objects. You want that, you take it. Much crime uh, can be explained in terms something like that. Whether it's somebody looting a store in a riot or somebody in Wall Street defrauding um, widows and orphans of billions of dollars, it still kind of comes to the same thing. So that is one level of the self, that of the body and bodily survival. As I've kind of suggested to you already, that seems to be a rather primitive, basic level. And there must be more to life than that. And the most famous diagram of some of the things I'm talking about uh, was done by a psychologist named Abraham Maslow in 1954. And it was called the hierarchy of needs. And like most hierarchies, it is a pyramid. This is what we've been talking about. The physiological breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, and excretion. Um, and those are the very, very most basic needs. Or as one proverb put it, uh, a man may have many problems, a man who has no bread has only one. So if you don't have things squared away on this level, uh, you have every, every, every motivation uh, to take care of those first. The next one is, of course, safety, employment resources, uh, the family of health, of property. These are all rather loose. And um, safety, well, is that really less than physiological? I don't know. If you, uh, if you are uh, a starving man getting his first meal for a long time and the bombs start to drop, um, well, is this really still more important than this? I don't think so. Like all schematic things, uh, it, this is very, very approximate. But this, we're talking here about physical safety, uh, integrity, uh, just the ability to continue on and continue our lives as long as, um, at least as long as our lives are bearable. Again, if you don't have any of these things, uh, they're going to become remarkable concerns for you. Well, at the same time, it looks as if these concerns are, because they're rather basic, you find yourself asking, God, there must be something more. Most, many people actually are quite happy there and don't really understand anything else. But most of us do. And that's because we are social animals. Now, because we are social animals, to get a lot of these things, we have to deal with that incredibly problematic entity known as other people, right? 
Well, let's say, <laughs> let's say you want to eat, okay? Well, let's say, uh, uh, okay, you want to eat, so there's employment, so you have to uh, keep your job. And in many cases, keeping your job has very, very much to do with your relations with other people. If your boss uh, wants you out of there very soon, you will be out of there very soon. Therefore, another element enters human life, which is, again, these are all rather mixed up. Uh, these are all very schematic, and um, I'm not even sure I agree with the order here, but this is so common that um, we may as well use it as a start. The minute you, you start to realize you live in a world of other people, which you do, of course, when you, you know, like two years old, you have to navigate other people's wishes. And little by little, through trial and error, through what mommy and daddy tell you, uh, through your mistakes and your successes, you kind of learn what you need to do under certain circumstances, even to keep this part going. Let's say uh, if you want to eat and you go to a restaurant, well, you like what the guy is having at the other table. So you reach over and you take it, rather than ordering it from the, uh, off the menu from the waiter as you're supposed to, which will not really get you very much of that meal. It will get you thrown out and you'll have to go and eat somewhere else. But uh, if you're doing something like that, your chances are not too good uh, there either. So you develop this whole realm of conditioning, of ways of getting these basic things by the manipulation of human society. And this starts to become a body of knowledge, a body of um, experience. And this is most oftenly, often called the ego, which is nothing more than the Latin first, personal, first person uh, singular pronoun, I. You know, and it's an I that's in relation to everything else. And you can get very, very, very good at this. You can become socially very, very adept. You can get into the country club. Well, what good is getting into the country club? Well, A, it, it really helps my esteem. I personally find country clubs rather boring, but you know, uh, other people disagree. Um, and oh, and by this esteem, I'm gonna get more of these goodies down here. Because hey, even though it costs me, I don't know, $25,000 a year to belong to the country club, it means I'm getting a salary of $600,000 a year, so uh, we can fit that into the budget. What's more, I'm hanging around really classy people who have the esteem of everybody else, so that makes me feel real good too. And so eventually, there's this dynamic between the eye of the body here and the eye of the social self. And the eye of the social self, this ego, is in the vast majority of humans in the civilized world, basically the boss. Uh, it's telling you what to do. It tells you uh, when to eat, when to drink, uh, when to sleep, because uh, yeah, you wanna go to, uh, you, wanna, you wanna sleep in in the morning, but no, you have that job because hey, we've already decided you're making $600,000 a year, so uh, you have to get up, you know, no matter how uh, hungover you are or, or whether you, you know, finish watching your series at 4 a.m. The ego uh, is the boss, as I say, in most of us, the conscious self that exists as a social entity uh, that is basically the nucleus of our everyday experience. So we've already transcended the self once, right? We've transcended this self, uh, and then we've gone into this self. Oh, did I skip this one? Well, I suppose I did. But uh, it really comes into the same thing, because you want to be, you're not alone, 
And human beings actually do have a need for affection. They actually, even just apart from just getting what they want out of other people, there is a genuine need for friendship, family, and sexual intimacy. That's what this says. Now, then, hey, there's sexual intimacy, and then sex is down here. So how do those two relate? Well, uh, that is, um, I don't know, half the great uh, novels of the world are about this very question. So um, we won't take that any further. So y you have this sense of belonging, this social self, and it's real. It's as real as this stuff. By the way, here's something that I don't know if Maslow addressed. This is, I love these weird cartoons. I mean, imagine you, you trained as a designer and you get to end up drawing these for your, for your job. That must be really swell. Anyway, um, uh, little things can go wrong. You can maladapt. Let's talk about the ego in terms of body image. This is a popular one these days. Your body image, for some people, becomes more important than survival. What is this called? Anorexia, bulimia. You have a defective idea of yourself. Uh, uh, people, usually women, have this condition. Uh, and they have a generally defective ego concept, which is, I'm fat when um, uh, their thighs look like broomsticks. That is maladaptive. But it is a sign that, hey, you're really bossed by this. It, this just happens to be uh, abnormal. There's a parable about this in the Gospels. Uh, and it's a parable about, uh, to put it briefly, uh, this household in which the master is away and the servant starts beating up on all, the, the servant who's left in charge uh, goes around beating up on all the other servants. One interpretation of this parable is that this ego, this def uh, deformed ego, uh, is starting to abuse the body. That's one type of malformation. But you can go a lot of different ways with this. Let's say your self-esteem is not so great for whatever reason, right or wrong. How do you fill this need? Well, since you've already decided in your particular case uh, you're defective or this person is defective, uh, you're not going to get it by any of the normal means that might actually get you what you want. So you revert to a lower level. That is to say, that's another body image problem. I don't feel self-esteem and I'm not getting it and I don't really know, kind of know how to get it. And you know, I, I basically kind of believe I have to be that way anyway because uh, somebody told me some, uh, some long time ago that I was a loser and I still believe them at some level of the mind. So you overeat. So you, hence the problem with obesity. Or um, your uh, close family members' attentions to you in the sexual direction are not entirely appropriate. As you know, this happens. I don't know what's going on here. I, I guess I'm just kind of a slut. So then uh, you, you don't get your self-esteem here, uh, but you start indulging in compulsive sex. You can start seeing a pattern here. Again, the ego is beating up. Uh, the servants in the household when the master is away. Well, who's the master? Well, we'll get to that. But let's go back to normal people. Here you are. You're, you, uh, you, know, you, have, you know, you have enough to eat. You have a decent home. Um, you know, you have a good job, you, you live in a decent neighborhood, you, uh, you know, you get along with your neighbors and your co-workers, you have, um, you know, a wife and the usual uh, adorable children. Um, you even have a certain amount of prestige in your community. 
and that something is missing. And this starts to uh, precipitate what is sometimes called, rather pretentiously, an existential crisis. A midlife crisis, shall we say. Because this classically hits uh, when, people, when people are in their early 40s. And I, I would uh, suggest that it uh, takes different forms for men and women, but uh, it's basically the phenomenon. Because suddenly, this all isn't really enough. In a society like ours, where there's no really genuinely or generally accepted uh, spiritual or religious value or context, and you may think that's good or you may think that's bad, but it is the case, um, you know, there's nobody uh, who can uh, figure out what's, what's beyond that. You might even very well go to your minister or your priest and, and say all of this, and um, you might get a, uh, an answer that um, is meant to be reassuring, but uh, is so vague as to be extremely disappointing. This happens. So where does the next step come from? Well, let's go to this one. This is a somewhat more sophisticated version of um, Maslow's chart. These are the, the four bottom ones that we just saw. And then you start seeing things here. Cognitive needs, aesthetic needs, self-actualization. And we'll, of course, get to transcendence. So you start to realize, you know, I, I have m more needs than just um, being accepted. Even, uh, you know, being um, greeted delightedly by my adoring children when I come home or um, uh, being around, you know, my lovely wife or husband and, you know, having my beautiful home with its yard and whatnot. Again, we're, we're talking in terms of successful people. There, there are many, many people who are grappling desperately with all of these things. And if you're grappling desperately with one of these things, as I think I've already suggested, um, it is no small problem and it is no fun. And if suddenly one of these gets kicked out, you have to go back and start dealing with it again. But we're, we're talking about people who, who you know, pretty much made it here. And yet, why is this sometimes not enough? Now, here you see this kind of case, particularly in professions uh, like lawyers, and accountants, uh, people in the business world, all of whom have plenty of this. These are all respected professions. But, you know, I never really kind of wanted to be a lawyer. You know, my father, I, I, I uh, had a neighbor who uh, uh, had this happen to him, and the consequences were grim. You know, his father wanted to become a lawyer, so he did, but he really hated being a lawyer. And, um, I'm not going to tell you that story because it's a very sad one. But um, you didn't really want to do all this stuff, even though it got you all of the things on this uh, you know, bottom tier of this pyramid. So what did you want? Well, actually, do you have cognitive needs? Yeah, it does. You do have cognitive needs. And cognitive means uh, doing something that interests your mind. It may be that you didn't really want to be a, a lawyer because you don't really like law. Uh, you don't really like being an accountant because you hate numbers. And there are people like that. And here's the big one. Wow. Uh, as you already saw, this one wasn't on the first um, diagram. And you could argue it's not even on the diagram of the United States because there are real aesthetic needs. Uh, that is to say, people need beauty in their lives. Let me say that again, in case you didn't hear it or weren't paying attention. People need beauty in their lives. Everyone needs beauty in their life. I'm saying this so emphatically and so um, provocatively because that is the thing we are most lacking in in the United States. Beauty uh, is of no consequence in terms of the general social milieu. Uh, if you go through, uh, say, um, 
oh, I don't know, the average um, community in the western suburbs of Chicago, just to take a random example. You know, it's, it's like three-dimensional um, linoleum. There's a, you know, there's a repeating pattern. You know, well, there's the Starbucks, there's the Home Depot, there's the, there's the McDonald's, there's the, uh, you know, it, 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 and all of those buildings are just incredibly ugly. They're just ugly. Um, it wouldn't cost that much more to, to build a beautiful building. Uh, but somehow, no one seems to think this is important. And so our uh, human-made landscape is probably the ugliest in the history of the world, which is pretty shocking, considering this is also the richest and most powerful nation in the history of the world. And this leads to a number of questions that would be at least another lecture in itself. But we are starved for beauty. And I think this has very, very, very much to do with the tens of millions of cases of depression, anxiety, drug use, uh, all of which seem to be very mysterious. Oh, well, we, have, oh, we have such a, a wonderful, successful society. Everybody, you know, people, most, a lot of people have more money than they can waste. Why is it like this? Well, because beauty is not considered. The only way Americans generally can experience beauty uh, is to visit parts of a natural landscape that has not uh, you know, gotten to the hands of the contractors yet. And as you know, there are more and more of those uh, contractors around every day. There is a lot of natural beauty. There is man-made beauty, but I would say that um, Practically all the ugliness in the United States is man-made. I'm speaking to us as a nation because I think it's particularly acute in our nation. Uh, there may be similar issues in other nations, in Europe and uh, Asia and so on, uh, but I don't know enough about those. And I think in many of those countries, uh, even if they're a little bit more uh, primitive than ours, they... Um, have some respect for beauty, even if it's only for beauty in something that was built 500 years ago, which we do not have. Uh, so I think this is, uh, this is a real need. This is a real need. Uh, and it's just not noticed. And I believe this is a cause of a great deal of suffering. Now, to go back to the individual level, well, you have aesthetic needs. I mean, in some cases, these may be far more forward than they are in other people. That is to say, your aesthetic need may be so intense that you need to be an artist. You always wanted to be an artist. Uh, and all of this stuff really is irrelevant to you. One of the most famous novels about this subject is, is by Somerset Maugham. It's called The Moon and Sixpence. It's, about, it's based on the life of Paul Gauguin, although loosely. It's about this London stockbroker uh, who's a successful stockbroker, as stockbrokers go. And one day he just leaves his family. He just gets up and leaves his family and goes to Paris. He vanishes. Finally, somebody finds him. So, what did you do? You left your family. You left, you left everything behind. I just want to paint. That's all I want to do. I want, and this guy is not very pleasant or very sympathetic. He's, he's, he's you know, pretty nasty to his family, and he's pretty nasty to most of the other people in the novel. But this man's aesthetic needs were such, and you know, I think Mom, one reason it's a fine novel is that Mom hit something accurate there. How much it has to do with Paul Gauguin is another matter, uh, which, frankly, I don't know very much about. But those are your principal needs. So, and, and these start to get very close to self-actualization. Now, again, there are levels of the self. There's the I of the body. Me want eats. There's the I of love. Uh, I need to find a beautiful girlfriend or a handsome boyfriend to eventually become um, my, my um, adorable spouse. There's the self that needs community esteem, uh, esteem in the world of achievement. And each one seems, in a way, to transcend the ones below it. Transcendence, of course, does not necessarily mean, does not mean rejection. 
You're going past something. In a sense, you're already there, and you need to go further. But self-actualization has to do with finding the real meaning in life for you, the work that you need to do for yourself. Uh, people, when, the, when people kind of have lost their bearings, they tend to think of this in, in rather um, stereotypical terms. So uh, the, the frustrated accountant um, you know, drops his job and goes to um, Sedona and becomes a massage therapist. Well, that may or may not be authentic. It may just be kind of like a, you know, his cardboard idea of authenticity. But what is this purpose in you that is meant to be uh, brought out? Uh, and how do you know where it is? Well, actually, I just learned about this a couple of days ago. There is an institute um, in New York and with a branch in Chicago called the Johnson O'Connor Foundation. I only know very little about it. I just read about it. Um, and they do what is called natural gifts testing. And you go and you play with blocks and you, you know, see how good you are with tweezers, how, good you can, how well you can remember tunes. And this test uh, tells you what your natural aptitudes are, which may give you some idea of the, the, the parts of yourself you most want to actualize. I'm seriously thinking about uh, having my children do this. The, uh, the uh, minimum age is 14 and they're not, they're not there yet. But I think that might be one way. Uh, I have no... I have no stake in this, in this organization. I just heard about it. Um, it may be great, it may not be, but uh, sometimes aptitude testing may lead you in that direction. Another thing is what you like to do in childhood. Did you like to put things together? Uh, did you like to play with machines or trucks or whatever? Well, that might be a sign. Did you like to play with guns? Well. Maybe a military career is for you. I had a lot of guns when I was a kid. I, I had a huge number of guns, and um, I've never joined the army. I've never gone hunting or anything like that, but they were definitely fun when I was 11. Um, you start looking into this. What exactly draws me? What, what expresses my deepest self? Now, actually, I'm putting this in rather romantic terms, but it may well be that you really love numbers. You really love playing with numbers. You're really good at numbers. And you've actually found your home as a CPA. You really like um, disputing with people and um, you know, getting it one over on someone else. And hey, it sounds like a great uh, lawyer's career. And, and those are legitimate and meaningful things. The problem is not that they're not, it's just that, um, are you in the right one? You sometimes even wonder when you go to the doctor if uh, uh, the doctor didn't um, pick the wrong profession. It's like, you know, gee, I'd rather not be here. How are you, Mr. Smalley? But, enough of that. So, you know, there's some, in a sense, kind of the purpose of why you were born, you feel. Uh, I knew a woman years ago who, from the time she was 11, knew that she wanted to be a dentist. She knew that she wanted to be a dentist at age 11. What did she do? She went to dental school. She became a dentist and practiced, as far as I know, still successfully. That was her thing. Why? Well, we don't know. But it's just as well, because we do need people uh, who, who actually feel that life's work is dentistry, rather than um, you know, wishing they were painting on the island of Tahiti or whatever. Um, so then you have this kind of question of self-actualization. You, you actually kind of fulfilling some kind of deep creative need in yourself. Now, most of the Maslow diagrams you will find on the internet and here. Self-actualization, that's what we were just talking about. Moral, you know, um, but, and higher values come in, morality, creativity, spontaneity, uh, you know, uh, open-mindedness. You know, people who are self-actualized do seem to have some of these qualities. They do seem to have um, 
a higher moral sense than perhaps uh, many people do. They are more creative because they're expressing what they want to do. Uh, they're not, they're spontaneous because um, they're doing what they want to do. They're not like um, second guessing everything um, to get past their own um, ambivalences and um, blocks. They're good at problem solving because they're good at what they do and they know how to solve problems in their own milieu. Uh, again, they're, they're satisfied themselves, so they're, they're free from prejudice or relatively so, um, and they are at home in their own skin. So they're willing to accept facts as they are. Um, and as we all know, facts as they are, are not always great. Uh, we also know that we have an enormous tendency to um, worry and grieve and fuss and make facts seem a lot worse than they are many times. Uh, but a realistic approach is kind of neither to be like deludedly optimistic nor uh, deludedly pessimistic. You kind of see the situation clearly, uh, but you can handle it without getting too upset about it. That is a mature, what Maslow would call self-actualized person. And in that sense, you could say all of the, you've kind of transcended all these levels, again, without necessarily having um, totally left them behind. So is that self-transcendence? Well, I don't know. Because, hey, this diagram, which I suggest is the more accurate one, uh, gives us another sense. And this starts to get into the question of what is the self to begin with. And all of these things are selves. Gurdjieff, the um, uh, mystical teacher, said that you know, uh, man has many eyes, man is, is a legion. And many people, if you're not integrated, well, this wants this, that one wants that, uh, this one wants yet another thing. Um, you know, I'm uh, a, a congressman, but on the other hand, I, I, I can't keep uh, my, my hands off the interns. Um, you know, there are all sorts of conflicts possible here. Um, but, you know, let's say you have made it up this way. So you, got, you are kind of yourself. What's beyond that then? And here, the only real answers start to come from the mystical traditions, the world's esoteric traditions, uh, which can be found in all religions, uh, including Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, all of which uh, frame the matter in certainly different terms, but at their heart uh, are probably talking uh, about very much the same thing at least much more than people would like to uh, admit. And now you start to look in. And this is the object of many types of meditation. Let's set all of this stuff aside. This is all quite external. Let's look at it from within. Well, you're meditating there. You're sitting there quietly. As I say, I, I think meditation is, much of meditation has a subjective, whether uh, it's stated that way or not. Well, you're sitting there quietly. And one thing you notice is that you have lots of bodily sensations. If you're kind of a novice as a meditator, uh, you have a lot of them. In fact, you have so many of them that you find it hard to sit still. I mean, some people are more restless than others, but some people are very restless. So there's this whole realm of the body. Again, we're viewing it from the inside now. Because we want to get, well, I'll tell you what we're trying to get at. All of you have all of these sensations. Are they us? Uh, well, Many times, in many places, many circumstances, yeah, they do seem to be us. And if they're unpleasant, uh, they require immediate attention. I love it when people say, 
well, you know, you got all these problems, but just think about how well, uh, no, I think you're, you're, you've got all these problems, but think about how life, how great life is in all the rest of your areas. It's like, yeah, well, it's like telling a man who's being tormented by a speck in his eye, just, just sit back and just be grateful about how well his digestion is functioning. Yeah, that really works. In any case, you have this world of bodily sensation around you. In fact, your world is the world of your bodily sensation. So is mine. You don't know anything, well, for the most part, that doesn't come in that way. So that's one level. That's the body as experienced from within. Well, you're sitting there meditating, and you know the body's kind of you know simmered down, and everything is um, you know you, you you're actually able to sit fairly comfortably, but then you notice that there's this whole cycle of thoughts, emotions, and um, ideas, worries, concerns. Oh God, I have to pick up the kids at five. Um, oh God, I hate the thought of that meeting tomorrow. All of these things are going by in your head. Uh, uh, under their own propulsion. Are you making them happen? Well, maybe you are, but uh, it sure feels, uh, if you are, it's, they're certainly hard to stop. So this is another level of the self. I would correlate this uh, more with the ego down here, uh, because all, all, but all of these images are coming, these dreams, these thoughts, oh, these beliefs, those are good ones. Um, you are a very, very free person if you have some degree of distance and perspective on your beliefs. Uh, and I am not going to make any reference to current events uh, uh, to illustrate that because I think you can think of them yourself. But you have all this. So that's another world around you. That's an inner world because it's not one you share with everybody else. Right? The other world, uh, yeah, I'm in the same room, you're in the same room. Yeah, we can see that chair, we can see that desk. I'm sitting quietly, what's going through my mind, only I can see. So it's a more private world. Well, the thing about both of these levels is, again, going back to what meditation may be about, if you quiet down enough, you can watch these things almost as if they were happening to somebody else. There's a sensation, your leg, arm, whatever, um, and you're aware of it, but uh, there's some distance between you and it. Your um, thoughts, your dreams, your fantasies, your fears. In fact, it's a one practice is watch all of those go by as if they were images on a screen. And it's easy enough to do uh, a good number of times if you do that with any um, seriousness, you might fall asleep, but that's all right too. But if you don't fall asleep, you start to realize, well, there are all of these bodily feelings and desires. You know, I, I could really go for a cup of coffee now. Um, all of these uh, images uh, about your self-maintenance, your dreams, whatever, your desires. And you can, there's something that can still watch all of these things. So hey, guess what? All of these sensations all of these thoughts, images, worries, fears, hopes, if you can see them from a distance, an inner distance, of course, they must not be you. Because you're somewhere here and you're watching these things around. In normal life, you don't. You, you actually think you are your body and your thoughts. But uh, in, in this particular context, you're actually watching this stuff go, go on. And it seems to go on, in a way, almost independently of you or the I that is observing. And this I that is observing is the key, I would suggest, 
to many of the great spiritual traditions. And it has many different names. Uh, and it is actually sometimes called the self. Uh, uh, the Hindu, uh, I'm sorry, the Sanskrit word for it is um, Atman. It is the silent watcher. It's there regardless. It doesn't do anything except watch. It doesn't have any name, shape, or form, because all of those other things are things that you can kind of see outside you. It just watches. And this is often called the capital S self. So self-transcendence uh, takes us to this level. However, there is yet another level one can go to. Because if you, oh, by the way, here's a, here's a note about the self, uh, uh, a famous saying of St. Francis, attributed to St. Francis is, um, what you're looking for is what is looking. I don't know myself, where am I, who am I? Uh, you're, you're what's actually looking. You just don't realize that. And it's an important level of self-knowledge and transcendence. Oh, yeah, I kind of see that now. And once you see it, you can never be quite so fooled by the external world again. You can throw around terms like uh, liberation and enlightenment and whatnot, and those all are all well and good. But um, if you even have a glimpse of what I'm talking about, it's enlightenment to the extent that there's a lot of nonsense that you're never going to be able to take quite as seriously as you did. Well, you can start asking questions about this, this I, myself, I? Wait a minute, is it just this I? What relation, there must be other eyes around to what relation do I have to it? Well, and then you come across kind of the great revelation. And this is again why uh, mystical and esoteric teaching sounds so paradoxical, because you, you decide, that you discover that that in you which says I is exactly the same that says I and everything else. Well, just the fact that I've said this um, hardly makes it clear. And in fact, the English language with this neat little system of three pronouns starts to break down. What, um, what is most deeply I is what I most deeply share with others. How could that be? Again, from um, ordin level of ordinary reality, it makes no sense. From another level, it makes complete sense. So if this I is universal, and each of us is, shall we say, um, one lens out of which this universal eye is looking. We are all one, aren't we? And this answers another little uh, conundrum that comes up. Because people go around saying, uh, we are all one as if it were a soft drink slogan. Yeah, what does it mean they're all one? Are we all one? Of course not. Hey, I got the job, you didn't. Um, you know, you got that house, I didn't. Are we all one? No, certainly not, not at this level. Uh, the mystical teachings say that this level is not in some, shall we say, ontological sense, totally real, but that's just another lecture. But all of this is, shall we say, one consciousness. Uh, there are two great world religions, uh, which are very close to one another, and they are Hinduism and Buddhism. And one could simplistically say they really only differ on one point, the existence of the self. Because I've just given you the Hindu position, which is Atman, the self. But the Buddhist position is the opposite. It's in uh, the Pali language, or another language of India, it's called Anatta, there's no self. Uh, so these things would seem to be totally contradictory. But if you start poking around, you start listening to what you're talking about, well, the Hindu Atman, this universal field of consciousness that encompasses everything, uh, starts to look a lot like the Anatta of the Buddhists. And sometimes you wonder if the difference is not uh, merely one of emphasis and terminology. Uh, and 
I'm not getting into doctrinal disputes, um, and I'm a, a representative neither of Hinduism or Buddhism, so it's um, beside the point anyway. But you're starting to see this, that everything is this kind of field of consciousness, awareness, that far transcends the physical, it, it also far transcends physical space, hard as that may be to comprehend. And this is, we're starting to get at this point to the, uh, or beyond the point where we can say about it, anything about anything in words. And to have a sense of this universal kind of ocean of consciousness that we're in, that's uh, one metaphor that's used to it, is a form of self-transcendence. And it takes you very, very far from all of these levels that we've gone through. It would seem that this level of awareness of the unity of one's own cognition with everyone else's is about as far as you can go and still talk about anything in um, ordinary language. Yeah, I actually think there, there are lots of other dimensions you could go and lots of other directions you can go in. But I think for us now here, uh, what's possible uh, to talk about it in any kind of uh, familiar way, this is about as far as we can go. And that is as far as I'm gonna go tonight. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I hope this has been helpful to you.